everyone, I'm Matt Burns. Welcome to TechCrunch Live. We're live at CES for the very first time we're in person. I'm so thrilled to do this. You know, hardware is, has been a big passion of mine and can, the Consumer Electronics Show has been this massive show for electronic hardware for years. And it's, it's back in person this year and it's bigger and better than ever. So we're excited to bring you this show live and in person. But first, before we get into our guests, I have to read an ad. So hold, hold with me here. A Round is delivering the future of in-game sports entertainment and fan engagement through stadium-wide shared augmented reality experiences that bring audiences together into action like never before. This for A Round partners with the Los Angeles Rams to introduce the next generation of shared AR. Learn more at AroundAR.com. And thank you very much to A Round for, for allowing us to do, to do this. All right, Stuart, how are you? I'm well, thanks. It's great to be at CES again. Super exciting, like so much energy and so many people, you couldn't even get on the monorail today. Absolutely. It's, <laughs> it's very packed. Yeah. So you're the founder and CEO of Echobee. You guys created the very first connected thermostat back in 2007, right? That's right, yeah. So I want to get a few things out of the way. You've raised $147 million? Approximately, yeah. Yep, $149 million. You were, you were acquired by Generac in 2021 for exactly 770 a year ago. million. Yeah, 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 exactly a year ago. Yeah, it seems to me that if you were this, if, if you got acquired, you no longer have to come to this show. But here you are. <laughs> well, I, I'm super excited about uh, technology and our mission, and really, you know, how do we help people live more sustainably, like simpler and better, but also more sustainably. And um, you know, I think in the venture world, you always talk about exits, but really, to me, it's like another stage in the journey. And, and one of the things that we talk about a lot is, you know, when we started the company, we wanted to have impact, environmental impact. How do we grow our environmental impact? And that's really about doing it at scale. And so Generac really allows us to take like the next step, the next you know, order of magnitude increase by adding solar and storage to our products and, and really creating this future where we see an abundance of really cheap, clean energy. Um, and so despite everything you read about climate change, you might be in California right now under tremendous rainfall. Um, but the future, I think, 10 years from now is one where we have an abundance of very clean, cheap energy. And it's more about when you use that energy versus how much you use. Sure. Um, and that's a great future. Now, you, you must have came to CES for years. Yeah. I've been coming for years as yeah. well. And I have a ton of questions to ask you about, about product market fit and fundraising. Yeah. But I want to start with CES. How do you think that a hardware startup can best utilize a show like CES? CS is uh, is awesome, and it's awesome for so many reasons. Um, you know, I think everyone is here, right? And so, mm -hmm. whether it's your suppliers, whether it's your competitors, whether it's media, whether it's customers, they're all here, right? And I think one sure. of your challenges as a startup is how do you get attention of all those people, right? And um, and if you're just picking up the phone and you're calling, you know, it's a really hit and miss thing. Whereas, you know, everyone's here. Usually they can spend you know 15 to 30 minutes. Alternately, you know you can go to their booth and you can like trap them and they, they you yes. know you're like a dog on a bone like they can't shake you you know. But you really have an opportunity to create some phenomenal partnerships, to meet people, to explain your story, um, all at one time in a very condensed place. And then it's just super energizing I think you know to see uh, all the people, all the great yeah. innovations. We were talking about it. You know, I've seen the LG like wall of screens, you know, probably five or six years in a row. I don't know how many years they've had it every year. I'm like, whoa, that's so cool. Um, you know, and so it's just energizing. Yeah, yeah. Now, you guys are big now, but I want, want to take you back to 2007, 2008, 2009, when you guys were here as a very small startup, right? What was your goals and what should a goal for be for like a pre-Series A hardware startup? So I think for us, you know, there were a couple things that are that I think are pretty interesting. Like they used to have Startup Alley, which I think was really good, and you got a lot of uh, media, uh, a lot of buyers, and those types of things going through Startup Alley. So Startup Alley, I don't know if they still have it, but that was that was a, a really good thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think. The other thing is what we've done is we've typically set up a suite and we bring people into a suite and show them our products and those types of things. And again, like I said, everyone's here, so all your customers are here. Um, if you're looking for international partnerships, those people are here. Um, a lot of really interesting technology gets showcased here. So, you know, one of the things as a hardware company we're trying to do is figure out, like, you know, not just what what are the components that we know about, but we have this thing we call puzzle pieces where you basically take all the hardware components and you throw them on a table and sure. then you try and put them together in interesting ways to create like really incredible user experiences, right? And so finding out like what puzzle pieces to throw on the table is really important. Like new puzzle pieces. New puzzle pieces, right? So radar would be a really good example. Radar came into our last product, you know, but if you know, you're not at CES and you're not understanding kind of like what the latest state of the art in sure. radar is and those types of things, like, you know, that radar came from 
you know, a meeting we had at CES with a radar vendor, right? And, uh, you know, all kinds of things like that. I mean, you know, connected home is a lot about, you can think about it, about it you know, sensors, actuators, and brains, right? And so mm. sensors and actuators, people who make those things, they're here, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and so, um, you know, it makes a ton of sense for us, and it's always been really great. We've developed some phenomenal partnerships here, um, and just love being Do you here. see any alternatives? Um, I don't know that there's anything that's as big. Uh, certainly if you want to be international, I think, you know, this is a very international show, obviously, and from a hardware perspective, which I think is a little bit different, yes. you know, getting all the different component manufacturers, seeing what they have on their product roadmap is super, super important. Right. And I don't think there's another place where you can do that. Yeah. Now, should, should a startup have a goal of, of meeting media or meeting buyers or just all of the above? I think you want to, you know, leverage everything you can, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be here and you're going to bring people here, like, you know, try and meet with absolutely, you know, everyone you can and, and you know, make it uh, jam-packed and, um, you know, I think you can yeah. really do it all, right? I, I like it as, as a member of the media because there is everyone here. It's so much better to meet people in person yeah. than over Zoom yeah. after coming off of COVID for so many years. It feels like this show is much, much bigger than in the past. Are yeah. you feeling that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're you know, we're, whatever, two hours in, but you know, two just, in, just coming, right. coming in like, you know, today uh, into the show and walking through the floor, it's jam packed and you can feel the energy again. And uh, it feels like, you know, 2019, it's, uh, yeah. it's really great. Well, let's take, let's go back in time again. So you started in 2007. Why did you start Echo B? And, and what has that mission changed at all over the years? Yeah, we started, I mean, with a really simple idea, which was, you know, how can we help people conserve energy, save money, and reduce their environmental impact? And, um, you know, the insight we mm -hmm. had was... I got to pause you. You've said that a lot. It yeah. just rolled right off the tongue, right? It definitely sounds like that's a line that you use. Yeah, I mean, that's... The, well, yeah, it's, that's what it's, it is, that's, right? what, that's what we started. I mean, it's a funny story, right? Because what happened was I was, uh, I was trying to, like, I just quit my job. I, had a, I, was a v, I was a partner in a VC firm, and I had this cushy job, and I was like, screw it, I don't want to do this anymore. And I left, and so my wife was like, okay, honey, what are you doing? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so I was like, I'm gonna, you know, because I had some time, I was gonna like reduce our environmental impact. So I spent $26,000 on solar panels, and I went to buy a Toyota Prius, and my wife was like, whoa, honey, you don't have a job, and this is gonna break us, right? And that sort of kicked off this, like, what are practical ways that people can, you know, reduce their environmental impact? And the insight we had is that heating and cooling is 40 to 70% of your home's energy use. So actually better managing your heating and cooling is the best thing that you can do, but the products in the market at the time were impossible to use. And one day, you know, my wife came home and we had three kids under the age of five and her house was like, I think 50 degrees. My mm -hmm. wife was like, okay, honey, like either you or the thermostat has to go because like, yes. I, I can't live with both of you, right? And that kicked off the like, how do we, how do we make this better? If we could connect it to the internet, if we could use data, like weather, energy prices, how much better can we do? And the really cool part is that, um, you know, our customers have saved enough energy to take the cities of uh, Los Angeles and Chicago off the grid. Mm -hmm. And I think by next year, we'll add Houston onto that. Uh, and so it is a massive, massive impact. Uh, almost 30 terawatt hours of, uh, of energy saved, and so, you know, significant impact. Right, so in 2007, you guys were prototyping this. What would the market look like? So, I mean, it's really interesting, actually, because um, when, uh, you know, when we started and we launched the first, you know, smart thermostat, which was this, this one here, actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, we were really, oops, that's upside down. Uh, we were really proud of it. And, um, you know, if you go back in time to what that was, this was actually quite, forward thinking and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, then of course, I think it was 2010, I don't remember exactly, but Nest came out, right? Mm -hmm. And then it was like, uh, holy shit, like, you know. 2011. 2011, yep. you know, uh, this, uh, this isn't that good, right? And, and, and I think what it taught us, and it really changed the trajectory of the company, is that the difference between wanting to be good and actually being good are two very different things. And it really forced us to retool and think about what being great is. Um, and really think about what it takes to be great. And, sure. you know, credit the team to, like, you know, really go back and, you know, not give up and say, like, the, the, the world is over um, and, you know, create some really awesome products. And uh, I'll just tell one more funny story about that. Like, when we started, we were trying to raise venture capital, and venture capitalists were like, Stuart, nobody wants a $250 thermostat. No one cares about thermostats. No one will sure. ever, like, you know, and they looked at me like I was an idiot, right? And that was bad, right? And then after Nest came out, they were like, of course everybody wants a $250 thermostat, but you know, Nest has already won. And so then they looked at me with pity, right? And that was oh. much worse. Yes. <laughs> it was like, you're a dead man walking. And so I guess, you know, sort of the, the part of that message, I guess, is, you know, is, is you know, this idea, and, and I think a number of authors who talk about it, um, 
you know, really about having a worthy competitor. And they really pushed us to be better. Not that I want to give Nest any credit, but, uh, <laughs> you know, having that worthy competitor, having multiple players in the space, helping us grow the space and that kind of stuff is really important. Well, I reached out to Mad Rogers of Nest yeah. before oh, cool. this interview. Awesome. Yeah, and, and he had a couple questions to ask that okay. I should ask for him. Okay. But, but really the main one, um, I was told I was not allowed to swear on this show. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he thought it was very good, and I think the question I have is, is very for, 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 for Matt and uh, and Tony and what they accomplished. It's a huge, huge, wonderful. Yeah, they're they're curious how how the launch of Nest changed your product market fit. You guys were it seemed like you're going after contractors before yep. the Nest came out. Yeah, and then the Nest came out. So tell tell me what happened. So I think, you know, there were, you know, and maybe in retrospect they sound obvious, so I apologize if this sounds obvious, but I think the first thing was what I talked about before, which is this idea of like wanting to be great and being great being two different things. Mm -hmm. And when we started and we thought back through the, you know, the, the product that we built, we made a bunch of compromises, right? And I think sometimes as a startup founder, you're like, well, that's going to be hard or that's too expensive or they'll never go for that or it'll take too long. Sure. And so, you know, you start with this great idea and then you sort of negotiate yourself down and then you've got like an 80% product. And then if you're like me and your execution is 80%, then you got like a 56% product. A 56% product is actually pretty shit. And if you're a startup, you need to get word of mouth, right? And so you need people to love you. And so to, to get people to love you, you really need to be like a 96, 97% product. And that's one of the core lessons that, that Nest taught us. So that was a key thing. The second part was, you know, we really thought about what are the capabilities that we need to be really world-class. And we went out and we got, for example, world-class user experience and that, and world-class industrial design. And those two things, you know, had a significant positive um, impact. And then the third part was customer segmentation, right? And so when we started, I was like, we got to listen to our customers. And so every yes. customer support email that we came in, I sent it to everyone in the company, right? And, you know, we cornered the market for mechanical engineering professors from small northeastern universities because they loved our product and they just wanted more data on how your HVAC, you know, worked. And so yes. while Nest was winning with consumers, we were winning with mechanical engineering professors. <laughs> and so really thinking carefully about, like, who are your, your segments, like, why do they love you? You know, and focusing on your brand and those segments, I think, you know, really changed the trajectory for us. Oh, that was a long journey then, right? From 2007 to past 2011, yep. you guys were trying to find product market fit this whole time, yep. right? Yep. What, what did it feel like when you finally hit that? It's an awesome feeling. I mean, I think, you know, you, think the, you, know, you can feel the market pull. So how do you know that you have product market fit is, you know, the market pulls you and you start selling. You know, it used to be, you know, I don't know that I went out personally and sold every single unit, but it certainly felt like that, right? Yes. And um, uh, you know, and it was difficult and it was hard, and, and people didn't didn't know about it. And part of that was product market fit, and part of that was the market was early, right? Mm -hmm. And so it hadn't developed. I think you know, it's another thing that you know having Nest in the market did for us is, you know, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you better. And and, and one of the things is, you know, I remember one day I went home and I take the subway home and uh, I'm on the subway and like every single like billboard on every bus shelter, every subway car was a nest ad. And I was like, those bastards, they know where I live and they're just messing with my head, right? Yes. And then of course I flew to Chicago and they you know, put up a billboard in, everywhere in Chicago too. <laughs> it's like, it had nothing to do with me. I don't think they even knew who I was. But you know, um, but they created also some market and, and so part of our marketing strategy was how, does, how do we, um, you know, um, you know, get in behind the market momentum that they're creating, and we had this strategy, which was really win in the last three feet, right? So customers do reviews, win with consumers, um, and you know, win in the last three feet. Let Mar let Nest create a lot of the you know market awareness because they're spending a lot of money, something that we can't do. And we talk a lot about you know not trying to you know beat Google using the same things that Google does, right? We can't out Google Google or out Honeywell Honeywell. We have to have different strategies. Sure, sure. That, that, but it's that, it's that long journey that I want to focus yeah. on. How do you keep the team motivated and focused when there's a major competitor that just launched out of nowhere? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, we believed in the vision, I think, and, um, you know, the other thing I think is, you know, Daniel Pink talks about engagement and, you know, about, you know, purpose, um, mastery, um, mm -hmm. and autonomy, right? And um, as being critical to engagement, right? And I think, you know, one of the really exciting things about the business overall, and it hasn't stopped, is that, um, you know, we were getting better, right? And you could see yourself getting better, and, you know, 
it's, it's almost like one of those fitness apps, you know, where you can see yourself and you're getting better and better and you're like, sure. okay, I want to do more, right? And so, you know, as a team, it was incredibly energizing because you could see the trajectory of the company and, and the company was getting better and better over time. And I think that's incredibly motivating. And, um, you know, we were, you know, keen on our mission and we felt we had a better way of doing it. And so, you know, I think through that period, it was very difficult. Um, but it was incredibly rewarding too. Yeah, now you guys raised a bunch of money after the Nest came out. And I don't want to focus on Nest yeah. a lot, but it's a, it's a big milestone, right? Yeah. 2011, you guys were, were earlier and then they launched and you guys suddenly became bigger. What fundraising round really changed the company? I think the fundraising, I mean, it was interesting. We had a really hard time raising capital. So I know you, you, know, you sit in a lot of these podcasts and you hear someone say like, oh yeah, I just walked in in PowerPoint and rocked out with $100 million. I'm like, that was not no, that. No, no. Yes, some people say that, yeah. but the most people say it took me 100, 150 pitch meetings to yeah. get funding. Yeah, no, I was like 174, uh, at least 174 rejections. It was, it, it was hard. We were lucky in that we got funded by some of our largest customers. And so uh, we had a utility that was one of our customers and you know they did a five million round in, in uh, probably 2013, mm -hmm. or 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. And that, you know, but that time we'd only raised probably less than $20 million. Um, and then we did a big raise after we had, you know, after we were on the trajectory and, and you know, things had really taken off. But those early years, um, two of our core partners, one was this utility, the other one was Carrier Corporation. And so I'd say as an entrepreneur, VCs are a great place to get money, obviously, but um, go back into your customer base and if you have some good partnerships, you know, we were very lucky that we got funded from some of those partners. One of the partners that funded you was Amazon. Yep. And the Amazon Alexa Fund. You took money in 2018, 2017 from them? Yep. And you were the biggest one at the time. Would you do that deal again? Yeah, absolutely. I think our relationship with Amazon has been great. Uh, and, um, you know, they've been good partners. You know, I tell people it's like, you know, it's like family. Like, I love my family. We don't always get along, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I would say our relationship with Amazon has been like that. But they've been, you know, really, really great partners. And, um, you know, we were very early in that Alexa ecosystem. So, again, it was like working out, like, how the Alexa ecosystem was going to work. Um, it's gotten a lot easier, I think, to work with all of the major ecosystem providers because sure. now they're dev kits and all those kinds of things. And the, those days, there were, like, no dev kits and... You know, you know, they, we were all writing yeah. stuff all at the same time, live and shipping live, and so again, like super exciting time, and, and they were a phenomenal partner. Yeah, would would you advise other hardware startups to work with Amazon? Absolutely, absolutely. They, they have a reputation of of sometimes taking meetings yep. and then taking the ideas and producing those ideas on their own. Yeah, I think that's always a challenge. Like no matter who you meet with, right? And and I can. Um, you know, I can think of a bunch of meetings in our history where it feels like people took our ideas and went somewhere else. You know, when we thought about it as a startup, um, I, the challenge was like, if you didn't divulge what you were doing, you mm -hmm. weren't going to get the partnership either, right? So it was kind of like, you know, you either, you either lose this way or you lose that way. At least the other way you had a shot of, you know, building a partnership. And as I said, our partnership with Amazon was always, you know, really, really great. Um, you know, they've created their own thermostats. I think at the end of the day, you have to, believe that you can stand alone compete in the market um, or you should get out because right. um, you know you're going to compete and, and I think you know um, we're a good example of you know competing with Google for whatever it is 15 years and you know I'm still here you're still here and, 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 <laughs> and you found wood, an exit yep, yeah very good um, so you know I think you know you can do it and for us it made us better actually yeah now you guys went through a, a big prototyping uh, Exercise yeah. always, yeah. right? Yeah. I was hoping you could take us through that as well. So, when sure. if you're a young hardware startup, where would you start? So, so maybe a couple things. So this this was our first product, um, you know. And as I said, when we built it, we thought it was great, and um, you know, you can make your own conclusion, but. I don't think it's great. It's good, but it's not great, right? I think it looked fine. And 2007 thermostats did not look like that, and um, but we made one, right? And um, you know, if you look at what we do now, we're you know, and I brought a bunch of these, but you know, we make literally you know, 3D printing has helped, but like we make literally you know, hundreds of them, right, to kind of figure it out, and we use user testing. This is one of my favorites. Um, so this was an idea, and you know, we were in a room, and we're like, this should be like a river stone, right? And when you put it in your hands and you feel it as smooth like a river rock, and you know that feeling, and uh, anyway, and then we showed it to consumers, and the consumers were like, that looks like an overstuffed marshmallow, like yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and so I think you know you want to do lots of iterations and 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 test a lot and get consumer reaction, understand how it fits with your brand, 
Um, and that's become a lot easier to do, which is great and a lot less expensive to do. But I think you know one of the things that is a bit difficult in a hardware situation is that you know there's this idea of kind of like a minimum viable product, yes. right? And um, and you might call this a minimum viable product. I think it's more than a minimum viable product. And you're like, I want to get to market, and I think it's really great. One of the things we say is that you know we compete with Apple, right? And you know you might say like, well, Apple doesn't make thermostats. Like, what are you talking about? But when somebody uses our product, the experience they expect is the same as if they're using their iPhone, right? And if it's not that good, they're like, that's not very good, or that's crap, or you know, whatever it is. And so you need to set a really high bar. And so the idea of like getting to market quickly works against you from the perspective of consumers, especially in consumer electronics, expect a really high bar, right? Um, and then once you start shipping in volume, you know, if you run into problems, hardware is way more difficult, right? It's software, you just send a patch and you know, you're good. Hardware, depending on what the problem is, you can't necessarily patch it. And so, really being careful about your testing and thoughtful about that stuff. And you know, we learned the hard way. Um, you know, you have uh, three kinds of problems, right? You've got like the the 0.1 percent problems, which are not really a problem because they're a 0.1 percent yeah. problem. You've got like the 50 percent problems, which are not a problem actually because you're going to find it for sure. The hard ones are the 4 percent problems because the 4 percent problems, if you run like you know a hundred person field trial as an example. You know, you might get one, right? And is that a, you know which one of those is? But a four percent problem, like very hard to detect. But if it gets into the field and you have escapes, really, really expensive to fix. Sure. Um, and so you want to do a lot of testing, a lot of field trials. You know, have uh, you know release criteria like what do we have to hit in order from a customer satisfaction perspective before we release these products? And having very disciplined processes about how you do that is yeah. really important. It, it sounds to me that you're saying don't ship the MVP. Don't ship the MVP, I would not. What is the MVP for then? I think the MVP, you want to get uh, products in people's hands as quickly as possible, right? And um, you know, different markets are different, but certainly like, you know, if you think about all the HVAC equipment that's in people's homes, it's probably manufactured over the last 50 years. Um, and then, you know, we were talking about it before, like, you know, we live in Canada. You know, when we started, I didn't come from the HVAC industry. I knew nothing about HVAC. None of us knew anything about HVAC, actually. Um, and then all of a sudden you went to Arizona and someone in Arizona was like, yeah, I want to air condition and I want to you know, humidify at the same time. And we're like, nobody does that, right? <laughs> That's crazy talk, right? Um, you know, and so the way people use uh, you know, the equipment, you know, everyone in you know, where I live has a basement. Like, you, know, you go down to Texas, no one has a basement, mm -hmm. right? And so just all these different things about how your product fits, how people use it, you know, how they want it to work, all that kind of stuff. Getting that as quickly as possible. Uh, because the variability of where you're going to be installed is is different. Sure, sure. You guys started this uh, this whole smart home category, right? Yep. So you've watched a lot of products come and go. Where do you think most hardware projects fail? Um, I don't know. <laughs> sort of that line, like you know, each family is unhappy in their own way, right? Uh -huh. Like it's hard to. I think it's hard to generalize. I think you know, if I thought through the things that were uh, really important to us and things that really made a positive impact. Uh, it was those things. It was really thinking carefully about um, our brand and our customer segments, right? So who are the people that we're trying to serve? You know, who are the people who are going to get us to cross the chasm? Um, and then thinking about our brand and thinking about like, what do those people care about? What do we stand for? And how do those align? That was really, really important. Two, figuring out like, what are the real critical competencies we need to be successful? Um, so that was another uh, you know, key piece. And then three is really setting a high bar um, you know, and winning with consumers and really, you know, making sure that you win with word of mouth. Because if you can get word of mouth, you know, no amount of spending can overcome word of mouth, right? right and so, right. you know, having a customer love you, tell their friends about you and all that kind of stuff, there's nothing, you know, more exciting. I mean, I remember when we started, my wife was like, we'd go out to like someone's house for dinner or something like that. And she'd be like, if somebody asks you like what you do for a living, can you not tell them? Can you lie? Right? Because nobody wants to talk about thermostats, right? And then like a few years later, everyone was like, oh yeah, I've got my Ecobee. It's like so cool. And I'm like into connected home and here's my camera and I want to talk about it and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, that having consumers like talk about your custom, you know, your, your products and tell their friends and tell people how great it is, is a great way to move the, you know, the needle on your, on your product. But consumers are ficky or fickle, right? And, and so how do you keep up with changing consumer expectations? I don't know that consumers are fickle, right? I think, um, you know, again, that's like a brand thing. Like, what do you stand for and what do you care about? And I think one of the problems is, is that if you try and service all customers, they want lots of things, you end up with kind of like this Frankenstein thing. And, you know, a really good question is like, you know, are we trying to service customers who want the lowest price thermostat, right? 
And if you start trying to do that, then you're not going to put like a really crappy user interface on it because you, you have to to get that right. price point, right? Sure. Or you can say like, no, you know what? There's a market for that, but that's not the consumer that we're going after. We're going after, in our case, like a you know mid to premium consumer who's willing to pay for quality. You know, wants a product that's going to be installed in their home for the next 10 to 15 years. And you know what? It's going to cost a little bit more, but there are lots of things that. Um, you know, cost a little bit more that I'm happy to pay for quality, as long as I get the quality, right? Right. Um, and those types of things drive compounding decisions, and you know, things like you know, sustainability is another good one, right? And, and I think it's becoming more mainstream. But you know, it used to be like, well, you know, lots of people hate sustainability, and you know, you're going to piss off a lot of people because they're like, you know, I don't believe in that stuff. And um, but if you don't stand for something then you know, it's hard to cross the chasm. And so those people who, are, who love you, you want them to really, really love you, right? And you know, hopefully you can bring the rest of the people around, but having a few people who love you a lot is way better than having a bunch of people who are like, meh. Right, right, and I think one of the reasons people love you guys is you just sell the product and there's no subscription service. But, but with that, there's no recurring revenue. What did your investors say to that along the way? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we do a number of things. So one is um, we see a strong nexus between security and energy, right? And so if you think about, you know, how we help people manage energy better, um, it's really about understanding what's happening in your home and context, right? And, and really you manage energy in one of three ways. You're either home and awake, you're home and asleep, or you're away. So if we can understand that, um, you know, we can do a much better job of managing your energy, right? And so you know, we started putting sensors around your house and then we were like, now we have these occupancy sensors and temperature sensors, which was really about how do we make people more comfortable. We were like, that's a security system, right? And our customers were telling us, like, you've got a security system, like, why am I paying for, you know, whoever my security provider is? And so that really drove us into security, which is a recurring revenue service and, um, you know, we feel customers are really happy about it. The other thing we're doing is we're working with utilities. Um, and we've created a thermal model of your home, so everyone is, in, is individualized. Um, and we create a comfort model, so we understand the temperatures that you're comfortable at. And that allows us to adjust the temperature in your home without impacting your comfort. But that also allows us to um, you know, work with utilities to drive lower energy prices across the board, and customers get benefit from that. And about 20% of our customers are in utility programs and see tremendous benefits from those. And so you know, there are a bunch of things that we can do and, 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 and work in different ways. Um, and again, I think you know, part of what we're trying to do is you know, we're designing products that are built uh, for your home, not for landfill, right? And, Rather than like, how do I upgrade you to the next possible product? And you know, can you buy this next product that sure. I have two years from now? We're like, we want to be in your home for the next 15 years, right? And you know, create this software platform that allows us to deliver you know better services over time. And so you know, somebody I never thought I would say this, which is like, my thermostat has a 1.5 gigahertz quad core CPU with you know two gigs of flash and 500 megs of RAM, but it does, right? But why does it have that? It's got like five radios in it. Like, why does it have that? Well, it's so that you know. It's software upgradable over time, and as we improve the product, you get the benefits of all those upgrades. And ideally, we're going to have a very long-term relationship with you because you know you get all those benefits. If we went the other way again and said like, "Hey, we want to be the cheapest thing in the market," you don't have enough memory, you don't have enough CPU, you can't do some of the things that we're doing that you know we think will have significant benefits for consumers over time. I think it's great that you guys can say that. It, it's a, that's a really hard thing to sell to investors, though. <laughs> that, that we want to be a 15-year product. Yeah. We don't want people to buy our new product. Yeah. So what advice do you have to hardware startups that want to follow your steps? I think one of my favorite lines is a line from Scott Adams, who's the Dilbert creator. And it's like, venture capital is the only profession where you get paid an outrageous amount of money to be wrong 90% of the time, right? And so, you know, I think it's bad, at, like, you know, we were talking about that. I think, we, you know, we were rejected 174 times for, for venture capital. And, um, you know, I remember VCs telling us, like, fail fast or give up now, right? And right. Um, uh, I don't smoke, but I remember, like, in the days when everybody used to smoke outside the building, and I came down from this venture capital firm that told us, like, to fail fast and, like, Stuart, it's all over. Don't, like, you know, don't waste your time. And I was so stressed. I was, like, I bummed a cigarette off somebody. <laughs> and I'm standing outside, and it's a February day, and it's, like, freezing cold, and I'm, like, smoking the cigarette. Don't tell my wife. And um, I'm, like, should I quit? Should I quit? Should I quit? And I'm, like, you know what? I'm not quitting until like they take the keys out of my dead hand. Like I'm just like you know I'm all in and I'm, I'm committed and and you know the, the short answer is people don't know. Nobody knows, right? Only you know 
And if you're committed and you're excited about what you're doing and you, know, you can create great products, you're going to do well. And, and for all the complexity there is, business at the end of the day is actually quite simple. You know, if you can build a great product at a reasonable price and provide reasonable service, people are going to love you, right? And that's whether you, know, you go to a hotel or a restaurant or you, know, you buy a hardware mm -hmm. product or whatever it is. Like, and so you know, focus on those three things sure. and the rest takes care of itself. Now I looked at your cap table a lot. Yep. And Relay Ventures has seemed to be a very good partner for you guys. How did you find Relay? Well, I was a partner at Relay Ventures. So, oh, well, that uh, helps. So, yeah, so, so uh, when I started my first, I started one of the first internet service providers in Canada back in 1994. And I met John Albright, who's the managing partner, uh, mm -hmm. when I started that business. And um, we did a deal with John uh, back in 1995. And I been good friends and colleagues with John ever since then and I spent eight years as a partner in a venture capital firm and then I woke up one day and I was like this is not what I want to do with the rest of my life and you know it was quite funny because when I you know quit that job um, you know people were like you quit that job like being a partner in a venture capital firm to start a thermostat company <laughs> you know, like, yeah that's you know you're 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 bananas anyway yeah so I, my question is is really how do you find that first partner and, and what should you expect from them um, I think you want to know that you're aligned uh, in terms of like vision and where you want to take the business. Um, and you want to understand kind of what their track record is. You want someone, especially in the early stages, someone who's really committed to the long-term vision, right? And, um, you know, red flags are things like structure and lots of terms and all that kind of stuff. Because I think as an early stage investor, you know, you don't make your money on like, you know, getting you from, let's say, uh, I'm making up numbers, like a $25 million you know, pre-money to like a 32, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like you're going from like 25 to like 500, right? Sure. Or whatever the number is, right? And so it should be simple, it should be fairly easy and straightforward. Um, it's very anecdotal, right? So when I was a partner in a venture capital firm, like, you know, you'd like to think that it was, you know, I'm quite analytic. One of the reasons I was not a good venture capitalist was because, um, you know, I'm quite analytic and I always wanted yes. to like, you know, work out the numbers and the math and all that kind of stuff and, and I could never do it. Um, and, uh, and so you have to, I think as an early stage VC, believe in the, in the promise. Um, and in many ways, you know, when you're starting a business, the easiest time to sell your business is, not sell it like sell it, but sell it to VCs, is when you have nothing. Because, you know, it, there's only upside from there, sure. right? You don't have any problems, you don't have a revenue track record, you know. And then it's about, you know, taking lots of meetings, meeting lots of people, creating relationships. I mean, I think one of the things that always surprised me when I was a venture capitalist is, you know, everybody sees like something like, you know, a partner will see something like 500 business plans in a year, right? I don't think that, you know, that number is controversial. No. Um, and so right. people would send me a business plan and I'd never hear from them again, right? And it goes into one of three piles. It goes into the like, I'm super excited pile, which is a good pile. It goes into the, I'm not excited at all pile. That's also a good pile. And then it goes into the middle pile, which is like, hmm, maybe, right? Maybe let me think about it. And those ones just keep stacking up and you, you know, you fall down the list and you get lost. And so, but, you know, if you're not calling me, you don't want to bug me, but if you're not calling me like on a sort of regular cadence to say like, hey, how's it going? Like, just can I, you know, tell you any more information? The number of people who sent in or, you know, we had a meeting and I never heard from them again was high. You know, I've done a lot of these interviews and, and we've talked a lot about board members, but yep. there have always been SaaS companies or medical companies, yep. never hardware. Yep. What should a good board makeup be for a hardware company? I think you want like a good, a good group of independents. Um, I think also you want to know, um, you know, what you want out of your board as a CEO, right? And so are you looking for like a Rolodex? Are you looking for connections? Are you looking for operating advice? Um, you know, I think some of my best board members were people who had sat in the seat that, you know, I was sitting in, but had, you know, developed the business like a lot further. And those people were super helpful because they really, um, you know, cut through a lot of the noise, first of all, in terms of like helping the rest of the board stay focused on like, let's just stay focused on what's important. Um, and also you as a, as a management team, what's important, um, you know, and mentoring you in terms of like how to be successful, how to run a large company. I mean, one of the things I didn't expect was, um, you know, I was like, okay, if we get to like, you know, I'm making up a number, you know, 50 million in revenue, like, you know, life will be easy and it'll be mm -hmm. gravy, right? And, and um, we got to 50 million in revenue and it was like, man, it's way harder, right? And it, but the problems are in different places, right? And so the problems are like, you know, how do you manage 500 people and you know how do you communicate and all that kind of stuff and 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 so the the changes really 
change. And, and I think you know, one of the great opportunities as a, as a CEO of a startup company is reinventing yourself constantly sure. um, because the role that you're in, you know, I tell people when I started, I was the CEO, but really I was a product manager, right? And you know, I called myself the CEO and I could be like all chuffed up, but it's like, no, you're a product manager, right? And um, you know, now you know, there are about 600 people at Ecobee, and so how do you manage like 600 people? How do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them focused? You know, some of the things you talked about, that, that's a different skill set that I did not appreciate. Where, where, where do you feel insecure about your leadership? <laughs> well, that's a difficult one. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I have a good answer to that. I think, um, you know, we all have insecurities. I think, um, you know, you want, sometimes, you know, uh, I'm sure everyone's seen Animal House and there's that scene, you know, where they're all down and then, um, shoot, what's his name, runs around like, who's with me? Like, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. you know, anyway. I am a running around the office, who's with me, ah, kind of people. And sometimes <laughs> I feel like, you know, nobody's, Jim Belushi, that's who it was, right? It was Jim Belushi, I think. Anyway, he's running, ah, who's with me? And sometimes I feel like that. Sometimes John I feel, Belushi, right? John Belushi, sorry, yes. yeah, pardon me. And I'm like, okay, sometimes I feel like that. Yeah. You know, Ecobee is an interesting company, and one of our other editors, Daryl, who lives yeah. up in Toronto, he wanted to know where the name came from. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, two things, really. Uh, one was eco, which is really at the core of what we're doing, and, you know, how do we help people live more uh, in, in a more environmentally friendly way. Uh, and then the other part is really bees signify, um, you know, nature, and bees are communal animals, they're social animals, they work together. They actually uh, air condition their hives. Um, so it made a lot of sense from then. But the other part is that we work with this firm. So you've got like four engineers who are like, you know, marketing as a logo kind of thing was like our level of depth on, on marketing. And, uh, and so, you know, this firm is pulling out their hair. They're like, my, these guys are like morons, right? And uh, anyway, so the other choice they came up with was Lily Duck. And uh, so it was Lily Duck or Ecobee, and we were like, okay, oh. it can't be Lily Duck. So it's like Ecobee. It can't be Lily Duck. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm glad you went with that one. Now, uh, I have to get back here. The, another, another question that was submitted through Twitter, John Martin, he's the CEO and founder of Inlo. It's, a, it's an Internet of Things thing. It's, it's in your category. He really wants to know, and we talked about this briefly, but, but how can you make a profit? Does anybody make a profit in your space? I are, you, so. are you guys profitable? Yeah, I think so. I think absolutely. I think you have to think really hard about your margins, um, you know, and, and, you know, work on it every single day, right? And you, you know, to be a sustainable business, and we talk about this too, like if we want to have impact, and we want to have impact at scale, the only way to do that is to make sure you have longevity in your business. And the sooner you can cut the cord uh, from having to go and raise capital, um, you know, that is incredibly liberating. You don't want to be on the, you know, 18 month, you know, I got to raise capital every 18 months, I got to tell the story, you know, worry about the ups and downs in the markets, or, you know, sometimes you run into issues. Mm -hmm. Um, and so having the discipline to get to profitability, I think, is, is really important. And I don't think it is, um, like, I, I, I think you can get there. I don't think it's a, you know, it's an impossible task. But you need to be very disciplined, really in terms of thinking about what are the important things to move your mission forward, right? Okay. And trying to do less, right? And we generally try and do a lot of things. And if I look back and I'm self-critical, I would say there are lots of things that we did that, you know, we started and they were good ideas, but, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't either put enough weight behind them to turn them into really great things, um, you know, or we lost confidence or whatever it is. And, and so if I could eliminate all those things, um, you know, we'd be way better. We would have been much further ahead, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, being thoughtful about cutting those things, and I think there are quite a few things where, you sure. know, staying focused and really trying to do a few things well, right, rather than many things kind of 70%. Were you guys profitable when Generac bought you? Uh, we were, and I think, you know, the, um, or our core thermostat business was. So we, we separate things into like our core business and then okay. our, um, our, uh, our new business. Security would be a new business for us. And so, you know, we think about how we invest in those businesses in a different way. Um, but our core business was, I mean, I think, you know, one of the strengths and weaknesses of, you know, not being Nest, not being Google is we didn't have a choice, right? <laughs> like we couldn't raise capital, right? Or, you know, and in the early days, it was really, really difficult. And so, um, you know, we were raising literally like $5 million at a time and, you know, and that had to leave us. So if we had a burn rate that was more than $500,000 a month, like, sure. that's it, we're out. Like, uh, and so that really forced, you know, how do we think about margins and, you know, channels we sell in and all that kind of stuff. You guys tried or almost did a SPAC 
two, two years ago, right? Yep. What, what was the story behind that? Why did that fall through? Where would the company be if you had succeeded? So I think, um, you know, one of the exciting things was we had uh, lots of different options, right? And, and again, we were looking to raise more capital. And I think, you know, we, we had an opportunity to go through a traditional IPO. We had opportunities to go public via SPAC. Um, we could have raised money privately. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and each of those has their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so, you know, as we went through that process of trying to figure out where we would do our next capital raise, um, you know, we started working with Generac and, and, you know, one of the very cool things is we have a very clear common vision of where we think the world is going and what the opportunities are. Um, and that's really this world of, you know, cleaner, cheaper energy for everyone. And, um, and so it just made a lot of sense to tie up with them. And, and we wanted to get into solar and storage. They're already in solar and storage. They had a strong uh, electrical channel, which we would have had to build. And so it allowed us to really move our mission forward at a much faster pace. Um, and so it was a great outcome for us. Yeah, how long are you gonna stay around e Ecobee now? Uh, forever. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. This no, I'm it. excited. I think like the uh, you know we talked about this a little bit. Like you know people say it's an exit, um, and it's an exit for your VCs, but it's not an exit necessarily for you as a founder. And I think you know you can exit in a bunch of different ways. And this is the third company I've, I've started. I've sold all three. Um, and what I realized when I sold my first company is that like it was an exit. I made some money. It was great. And then you know the new buyers like ran it into the ground, right? And you're like, okay, I put my heart and soul into this thing. And like. <laughs> No, um, and so it was really an exit, right? And, um, you know, I think, you know, it, it, for us again, it, it was, it's, I see it more as a fundraising thing uh, because it allows us to really, you know, continue on our mission and, and, and really, you know, take the next step, add solar and storage. You know, I think from an energy perspective, if you look at what's happening, price of renewables is dropping precipitously. Um, so solar is the cheapest power you can buy anywhere, two cents a kilowatt hour. Um, you know, you're electrifying everything, so EVs, heat pumps, those types of things, and then you're connecting everything. And if you look at, you know, California curtailed enough clean power to power, I think, 200,000 homes in 2021, right? right. And that's yes. doubling every single year, yeah. right? So if you're a smart thermostat and you know that there is free clean power on the grid, you can take advantage of that, right? And that combination of you know being able to you know take advantage of energy arbitrage, um, so it's a combination of cheap solar, um, storage, but then these intelligent appliances that understand what's happening in your home in context, understand what's happening on the grid or what's on your roof, and then modulating the way they use energy to take advantage of those arbitrage opportunities creates you know amazing opportunities I think for consumers. I don't see why your wife uh, doesn't let you talk about this at dinner parties. <laughs> It's fascinating. <laughs> you're very passionate about it, so you're sticking around. Yeah. I am, absolutely. Yeah, so what's next for, for, for Ecobee? I think you know, we're super excited about you know, integrating solar and storage. If you're in California right now, there are huge debates on solar around you know, net metering and what's the outcome for that. You know, if you put solar panels on your roof, I tell people, um, you know, I have solar panels on my roof. I put them in, I think, in 2010, no, maybe 20, uh, anyway. Long time ago, I get paid 82 cents a kilowatt hour for everything I generate. That's a lot of money, right? Um, you know, and then about five years after that, you know, company utilities started saying, "Well, I'll pay you what you would pay me." So if you were mm -hmm. paying 13 cents a kilowatt hour, I'll pay you 13 cents a kilowatt hour for what you export. Now they're saying, like, we won't take what you're exporting, right? And so if you think about the ROI on your solar panels, like if you can self-consume that power, um, it's clean, it's free. You've already, you know, paid for it. Um, and you're just going to see more and more of that because sure. when you look at the energy markets, you know, coal is like at 13 cents and nuclear is at like 13 cents and then gas is at like 7 cents, but wind is at 5 and, and solar is 2. And so, you know, they clear the market first every single time. And, and if you're, you know, one of those other things, it's not government right. regulation that's driving those off, it's economics because you just can't make any money. And so having these intelligent devices that, you know, understand what's happening and, and can take advantage of that, I think is a, is a huge opportunity. Well, I learned a lot today, and they're turning the lights off for some reason. I don't know why. I don't, <laughs> that, that, was, that, was, that happens to me That all was a good the timing, time. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens to you. That's what you get for having solar. Yeah, Just joking. Right. No. Oh, it's uh, like, yeah, time to go home from the bar. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Stuart, thank you so much for joining me. This has been our first live and in-person TechCrunch Live event. Uh, I was thrilled to have you. So thank you so much, and I hope you have a great show. Awesome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll see you next week. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Great. That was really We're fun. We're good. Yeah, Thanks. Well, I'm glad. Hopefully, hopefully I didn't lecture you. You no. said I could, but hopefully I did. It, no, it was, it was very good.